You're going to work with a lot of people. You're going to fire a lot of people. Every once in a while, you're going to come across a superstar and say, why is this person such a delight to work with? What is it about me and them that make for such a great team? When you are bringing these people in, I know the majority of them have worked under blind, so they're pretty seasoned. But let's say that I'm recruiting a new person. Are you looking for certain characteristics of that person? So you can then say, hey, I want this done, go figure it out. Or are you bringing someone raw, teaching them what to do and then telling them to go do it? The reason why I can spot and pick talents and certain types of people gravitate towards me, the ones I give more time to, I've learned certain characteristics, but it's sometimes somewhat intangible. So here's what you're gonna do in the order in which you'll do it. There's some things that I like. I like people who are not process people. Process people work really well in things where there's a clearly defined process process. There's a manual. There's a decision flow chart. And they tend to be like really black and white. So when something happens that there's no process for, they freeze up. They don't know what to do because they don't like that responsibility. And they can't think this way. For example, and this has happened to us before, a car crashed into our building. There is no playbook for this. Literally, a woman avoided another car, jumped the curb, and literally crashed into the building, sending a shockwave where we thought a bomb exploded, right? I wasn't there. And now there's no playbook. And so non-process people go out, see what's happening, assess the situation and make decisions. So I like those types of people, especially for management positions. They make terrible worker bees, like who need to just do the work and are really good at refining. And we need a combination of those two types of people, right? What I'm looking for and how do we vet these people out? You're looking for someone who is asking really smart questions who can anticipate what the next steps are. That's just someone who's waiting to be told what to do. So when I interview people, I give them scenarios to try to understand and I watch how they respond. I want to see their brain at work. So if you ask someone in the interview process, what is your best trait and quality? They'll tell you what you want to hear. It may not be true, but if you put them in a situation where there is no clear answer and no answer is right and no answer is wrong, you get to see the person at least in that initial process. So when we interview strangers that don't know anything about us, that aren't fans of ours, we have to go through it this way. Luckily, we don't have to do this anymore. But in the old days, we'd give them a scenario. And the scenario would be something like this. You're having a great moment in your life. You invite three or four of your really close friends out to dinner and you say, guys, order whatever you want. It's on me. I'm celebrating our friendship, my recent success, and let's have a good time tonight. And you lose track of what's happening and people are ordering outrageous things, very expensive shots of whiskey or whatever, scotch. And then you see the bill is 10 times more than what you thought. You thought maybe we'd spend a hundred bucks a person and now it's a thousand dollars per person and you don't know what to do. How would you handle it, Mom? I would take that on the chin because I didn't communicate effectively. But if I could, if I realized that in the middle of it happening, I would probably very gently, probably a hair comedically because that's my personality, just directly tell them like, hey, I know at the beginning I said that we could do whatever and it's a party, but you know, there's a, still a bank account that I got to maintain. So let's uh, try to maybe reel it in just a hair but keep enjoying it ourselves. And then hopefully I'm not finding out at the end, but I'm attacking it once I realize that happened. Okay, let me let me tell you what I just learned about you that you may or may not like, okay? Oh, God. <laughs> well, here's what I learned. You have a high degree of professional, personal ethics, and you are slightly uncomfortable at bringing uncomfortable things to people. Number two is you try to rewrite the scenario. And a lot of people do this too. And I don't love it when people try to rewrite the scenario, which is like, well, that wouldn't happen because I did this. You're not accepting the scenario has already happened. So some of those people live in the land of denial. They like to try to like, well, this wouldn't happen. The scenario is the scenario. You can't unspill the milk. So here is what I think would be the perfect answer. And the reason why I asked this question too is because if you are representing me as a business ops person, as a frontline person, and the clients walk all over us, or there's a mistake that's not our fault, and you say, we'll just take it on the chin. I don't want you representing me. I don't take things on the chin like that. So you'd probably not be a person I would hire to handle money. But if you're like, hey guys, you know, this is a real scumbag douchey move that you did. And I don't want you doing that to our client either. And people do answer the question that way too. So here's how I would act. Hey, before we go too far, I just have a really simple ask. I'm not here to sell you anything, but it would mean a lot to us just to help with the algorithm and how it runs to leave a comment right now. You could type in what city you're from, type in your name, type in anything. It'll help other people find this video. And if you're truly getting value, don't forget to subscribe. The beauty of these open-ended questions is every person who asks a question has a different set of values and every person answering has a different set of values. You're not looking for the right or wrong answer. You're just looking for the one that most aligns with you. So you know that they're going to make decisions and communicate in the way that you would. And if they're close, you run three four more of these scenarios and you'll find out really quickly who's who. We've done this before where people have literally 
started to cry. And I'm like, I don't want you to work for us. It's not that you can't display emotions, but you're so overwhelmed with emotions that you can't even process what's happening. I don't want to run in after you to comfort you and then to handle the business as well. What the heck am I paying you for? You see? So there's a lot here. Here's how I would possibly handle it. I would come to the guys and gals and say, hey, I'm embarrassed to even bring this up. I know I invited all of you and you know you're my ride or dies, right? But I didn't expect anybody to order this and I wasn't paying attention. Totally my fault. I will leave this up to you. I was prepared to pay $400, not $2,000. If you feel like it, if you want to chip in, I'd appreciate it, but don't feel like you're, you have to. But this is way over what I thought it would would be and that's my bad so i take responsibility i'm open with my communication i tell them i'm even embarrassed to do this right business boot camp communication module speak the feelings tell them the reason tell them what you'd like to have happen but tell them that they're under no obligation to do any of this and i have literally said something like this during a very uncomfortable potentially uncomfortable client overage conversation i don't really know how we got here i take ownership for a lot of the way it got messed up but we're on revision 742 and i exaggerate not because i have documentation of this which i won't bore you with I know I'm obligated to finish this work. And if this is the case and there's no more money, I would do it. But I can't do this with you in the future. And I'd hate for that to end this way. I'm appealing to your sense as a fair business person to talk about changing the budget because of what has happened and changing the budget for future projects. I'd like to ask you for this. Let me know how you feel. And they're like, we're not breaking up, Chris. Really appreciate you. Here's what I can do. We can't do that, but we can do this, but we can also change all projects moving forward to this new rate. Does that work for you? I appreciate you a thousand percent for doing that. We met in the middle. I'm feeling good. I hope you're feeling good. Great. We'll continue to work with them. So this isn't some weird theoretical thing. This is what I have literally done. And I've seen the result of this and that's what I'm testing for. And depending on the person's answer when you're making the hiring decision, let's say that or you were interviewing me in that scenario. What decisions are you making as a leader for someone like me? Are you hiring me at that point? Are you asking me more questions? Are you No, no. Me? I ask lots of questions. The interview, okay. what they say, be slow to hire, quick to fire. Let's focus on the slow to hire part. Don't just assume. Don't read your resume. Don't look at the portfolio. Don't go off on the person's great looks or whatever it is and say, this is it. So run through several scenarios like this. The power and the questions is that people cannot prepare for them. What I would do is I'd run four or five more. And here's the key thing that you need to take away from this, which is you will never find the perfect candidate. And if you set yourself as a standard for it, a candidate to hire, you will never find anybody. What you're going to do is you're going to say, I really need someone now. And of the five candidates, this is the person who most closely aligns and is most likely to grow and adapt to the way we want to work. We can train the rest. We're close enough. And so if we say, if we were to ask five questions and score each one from a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest, the highest possible score is 50. I'm not saying I'm not going to hire you unless you score 49 or 50, but of the five candidates, you scored 40 and that's higher than everyone else by one wide margin. Therefore, you're our best candidate for now. I'll hire you. It doesn't work out. I'll let you go. Gave you the opportunity. So design yourself some of these, I think they're called scruples, questions about ethics and morality. They have no right answer. These questions are designed for management positions, not for worker B positions, right? Because when we're hiring for creatives, most of the times it's like, you do great work and I think I like you and we vibe. Let's go. Let's try. Because I can see in a portfolio. But when you're Talking about like thinking management positions, I can't see your portfolio. Resumes are BS anyways. Your referrals are bunk, you know, because you just ask people who are your friends to be a referral for you. Why would that even make any sense? And if you'd be so foolish to put a client or referral that actually doesn't like you on there, you don't deserve to work anyways. So that's why I'm like, I need to figure out a new way to do this. And I gotta tell you, it's worked beautifully. I tell stories. I create scenarios and I ask them, which character are you in the story? In my mind, I know what each character's strength and weakness is. I'll, I'll like, are you a Star Wars fan? No, I'm not. Don't worry. The interview is not based on whether or not you're a Star Wars fan. But I want to tell you a scene in Star Wars and tell me which character you see yourself as. There is no wrong answer. I just want to know who you are. And so the questions are designed in such a way that you cannot hide. And ever since we implemented this, we've had the best quote unquote luck in hiring people. They're always the right people.